Okay, here we are. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, the warm summer day for most of us on, on the Zoom call. And uh, I hope you are well and safe wherever you're watching and practicing with us from. So uh, tonight's topic was about getting stuck in walls. And uh, it made me think of the phrase, you know, sometimes we say, I've hit a wall. <laughs> Does you, uh, for me, that is evocative of exhaustion, where you've kind of, I've hit a wall. I'm just like, eh, baked, I'm done, crashing kind of feeling. Um, but it could also just be, you know, where we really come up against something uh, intense and uh, just feel that solidity of the wall. And um, so tonight's story is uh, referencing two books. I'll put both the links down below at the YouTube recording here. And uh, the first um, the first one is sharing a little story that Sylvia Borstein in her beautiful book, um, Pay Attention for Goodness Sake. It's a book about the 10 paramis or paramitas, the perfections of the heart. And, and I love Sylvia's writing. It's very accessible and easy reading and short stories. But she adds a lot of personal examples and she's just such a very funny and real teacher that I appreciate very much. Um, so she's telling a story in here. This is in the chapter on determination and how a uh, she was asked to come and speak at her grandson's grade six class. And um, to, because they were doing a unit in social studies on India. So she was coming because she practiced in India and been to India and to coming to talk about meditation and mindfulness. And uh, <laughs> So she was giving them some, the kids, some really practical, short exercises of mindfulness that are super great to do with kids and adults. And she was talking to them about wisdom and asking them, you know, what they think a wise person is and who do they know that's wise and not wise. And um, they gave great examples. Um, and she just kept really making it real and just talking about um, how the practice is mostly about paying attention. The title of her book, Pay Attention for Goodness Sake. And, and how valuable it is to pay attention and making it really relatable for them about their, you know, when they're trying to do their schoolwork or do a project to not be distracted and how, how helpful it is at different times for them to pay attention. And uh, then they, the kids got, opened it up for some questions. And um, one boy uh, said, I heard that people who meditate can tell the future or know your past, or even guess what you're thinking right now. For some of us, that might sound a bit uh, woo-woo. Uh, the And uh, she simply responded, that's true. <laughs> some people do learn that skill by meditating. And then she comes back. But mindfulness is about paying attention, you know, not to try to get them like, all right, I'm going to become psychic. And uh, then... then uh, the same boy continued, I also heard that people who meditate can walk over hot coals or lie on beds of nails. We saw pictures of that in our book about India. And she had to answer truthfully, yes, that is true as well, that sometimes people are able to attain a state of concentration and one pointedness and calm that they don't feel pain in the way that we usually do. Um, and they can do some very special things to prove how concentrated they are. And, and it goes on from there, like the things that people are able to do. And then she says, you know, but mindfulness is about paying attention in an ordinary way. 
of um you could just imagine this group of uh I, I think they're grade six did I say six-year-olds I think I might have a eh? uh sixth grade yeah in case I said that wrong <laughs> picturing six-year-olds they wouldn't ask questions like that um okay so these things are true and it's not what most of us are practicing for so that we can lie on a bed of nails um so this this young man young boy um same boy went on and uh he says well I also heard that once he obviously heard this from her grandson once you met a woman who was such a good meditator that she could walk through walls did you and she had to tell the truth yes I did and um He's very polite, but persistent young lad. And uh, he said, she goes on, she was old when I met her. She lived in Calcutta, India, but some of her students who were my teachers brought her to the United States so that people could meet her. So this is uh, Joseph Goldstein, Sylvia Borstein, Jack Cornfield, all of these teachers. If you go to retreat on IMS at IMS, Insight Meditation Society, you'll find a picture of um, this woman, Deepa Ma, um, in one of the meditation rooms on the altar. So this is a book about Deepa Ma. I'll put the link down below um, as well. It's um, Deepa Ma, The Life and Legacy of a Buddhist Master, by written by Amy Schmidt. And it's a, it's a fascinating book of such an incredible teacher. So it's hard to summarize such a life as hers, but she was born Nani Bala Barua and came to be named Deepa Ma later in life when she gave birth to her daughter Deepa, meaning mother of Deepa, Deepa Ma. She was born in 1911 in um, East Bengal near the Burmese border. And as was the tradition and the culture, uh, she was married at the age of 12 to um, a 25-year-old man. He was an engineer and, and as the tradition, sent to live with her in-laws at that age when she's married. Uh, and once she got there, I think they had like a week together and then he was off to work in Burma and she's living there now with her in-laws that, you know, she didn't feel they were strict, I'll just say. And uh, at the age of 14, she was put on a boat to Rangoon to um, go and live with her husband uh, where he was working. And over the years, they developed a very deep love. And um, she describes him as being a really special, unique man and very um, compassionate. Uh, also part of the culture and tradition it was the importance for her to conceive a, children and particularly to give birth to boys. And <clears throat> she had a lot of difficulty conceiving and there was a lot of pressure, like a lot of pressure for her. That was her one of her main purposes that she should do that uh, and her husband really supported her the family was like you know you should remarry and stuff and he said no that wasn't our contract and um that's not a requirement of our love <clears throat> i'm just giving you a bit of a background into some of what she endured at 18 her mom died she wasn't with her mom she only saw her a few times after she was separated from her family um and her mom had an 18 month old child that then came to live with Deepa Ma and her husband and they raised that, that child. Um, she did not speak Burmese either, so she didn't speak the language of where she was living. Uh, then at age 35, she got pregnant and to, uh, to a baby girl and she died after three months. Um, at age 39, she did have Deepa and then became Deepa Ma. Deepa was her daughter. 
and she had another pregnancy with a son who died in birth. So, the, and by this point, both of her parents were dead. So she had this immense amount of grief and stress and um, her health really declined. She was, uh, had heart, heart disease of some sort and hypertension and she was bedridden for a long time, which her husband took care of the baby, Deepa, and nursed her back to health and continued working full time. And then he had a heart attack and died. So like so much, so much grief. All through this time, she had such a strong calling to meditate. She kept saying, I, I need to go learn how to meditate. I need to go and find a teacher. And but she had all these family responsibilities that she was supposed to do. And um, it kept being put off and not able to do it. And finally, she was really dying from her stress and her heartache, really. Um, and was she felt she was dying. Um, and she finally met this teacher, Munindra, who introduced her to his teacher, the Venerable Mahasi Sayada, and who, who is the most renowned monk, scholar, and um, meditation master in Burma at the time. And maybe still. <clears throat> So she finally gets to go on retreats and has extraordinary experiences and very difficult experiences, but she's called to go back again and again. And she attains very uh, several of the stages of enlightenment, as they're called. And then she's chosen because she's such an such an ardent student and so um on five day retreats she goes into extremely deep states of concentration and uh pretty miraculous healings of her body etc so she's one of the few that are chosen to be taught some of these special powers and um, yeah, because Mahasi Saida was going to teach this to Munindra, but Munindra was too busy with all of his other teaching, and so they um, chose a few students. Um, and so they were introduced to, um, reading from this book on Deepama, they were introduced to practices of dematerialization visitation of the heaven and hell realms, um, time travel, knowledge of past lives, and more. Deepama was the most adept of all of Munindra's students and the most playful. It, was be it has been said that she nonchalantly arrived at her interviews with Munindra by walking through a wall or spontaneously materializing out of thin air, and that she came to master all five categories of supernatural abilities and uh so i really wanted to just talk about this stuff because for some of us that are very hmm, there's lots of words we could insert here but um for me it feels like a respecting of a uh, ancient lineages and traditions and practices that are unknown to most of us, perhaps, likely. And uh, I think it's kind of part of the colonializing of mindfulness and meditation that we strip away all of these things that feel like uh, foreign or mm, that's not logical or how's that happen or that's not possible and um, we discount these things. So I like to just put it out there as a, we don't know, we don't know, and um, it may be possible. 
Okay, so this is the context of who this young lad is asking questions about. I heard that you met this woman that can walk through walls. Um, okay. And uh, so he's, he's asking Sylvia Borstein, did you talk to her? And she says, yes, I did. Did you see her walk through walls? No, I didn't. And she says, I guess I thought that if my teacher said she did, then she did. Um, and he, he asked more, how did she do it? And uh, she said, I'm not exactly sure. And, um, you know, but they said that she could concentrate so carefully that all her molecules dissolved and she could pass through the walls and reconstitute herself on the other side. And of course, uh, all these kids thought that was very reasonable and were satisfied with that and they went on. And as it happens when, when a guest teacher comes to a school, um, then the project the next day is for the kids to write their thank you letters to the guest teacher. And so uh, sometime later, Sylvia receives this package of thank you letters from the kids. And uh, this is, so, I just love this so much. Um, they're, they're, they're just so wise, these little ones. Um, so, but this, this particular lad uh, says, thank you for coming to visit our class. I enjoyed everything you said. But I'm still thinking about that woman who concentrated so hard she could walk through walls. I've been wondering, what if she got distracted in the middle of walking through the wall? <laughs> Would she get stuck in the wall forever? Such a good question. <laughs> Such a good question. And uh, Sylvia, you know, then goes on to talk about, you know, this exactly, how we all, how frequently we get stuck in the walls, how we get distracted, how we get stuck in a place of aversion and clinging and desire and grief and fear, and et cetera, et cetera. How often are we moving through life and then we feel not only hitting a wall, but stuck in a wall. And um, yeah, the walls of anger and resentment, revenge, humiliation, etc. Sylvia says, every day I bump into mind walls, walls that feel solid because the impact is painful. Isn't that so true? The, when we're really coming up against something, it feels so solid, so permanent. It's always been this way. It's always going to be this way. I am this way. You are that way. Everything becomes very solidified and solid and painful. She says, only when I remember that the walls are the habits of my own mind and that I build them, I built them, and that they will continue to exist as long as I insist they are real, only then can I stop building them. Then my mind relaxes and I see clearly. I see that the walls are empty and then I walk right through them. Uh, I I just think that's so true in my experience. And really, any time when I experience the ending of dukkha, of suffering, of a, a, a contracted heart or mind, I the way that is liberated or frees its um, hold is when it's when I see how I've been building it, how I'm fueling it, how I'm, you know, packing the bricks on, like, yes, they did do that, and they shouldn't have done that, and they are always that, and I am, and each one of these thoughts is cementing in another brick. Yeah, 
uh, and that the practice is not about never getting trapped in a wall or hitting a wall because we are, we will we are and it's about recognizing recognizing when that's happening and choosing freedom choosing to move through it and paying attention so that we don't get stuck forever seeing how am i cementing this into place how am I reinforcing my belief and justifying it and fortifying my rightness and your wrongness, which is generally what it comes down to <laughs> a lot of the time. So maybe some of you can dematerialize to move through walls. And it, um, if not, have faith because you don't need to. <laughs> what we need to do what we can do what's what matters to do is to see when we're caught when we're solidifying when we're fortifying see what the fuel is and that we have a choice to stop that in that moment of choice is the freedom to move through Yeah, there's many more stories we could share about this. And I wish we were all in a room together to talk about our experiences of when we felt stuck and how we got free. So encouragement to really reflect on this for yourself. Take some time for reflection and we'll add this into the meditation tonight of times when you felt stuck, or maybe even right now, like it comes in minor ways, usually through a day, little things that we want or don't want or wish were. And, but it may also show up more as like the really strong experiences of um, suffering. <clears throat> and to recall times of freedom or how you moved through that. Is it because you were able to control everyone else and everything else? I don't think so. <laughs> Is it because you were able to do some process of reflection and clarity and calm and compassion? Maybe that came through a, a conversation with someone or reflection or time in nature or meditation. <clears throat> Sometimes it happens, it seems almost like uh, these, uh, you know, not to take these words literally, but some sort of a, I'll call it grace. You haven't really figured it out, but somehow a light comes on, somehow through your practice, through uh, your good fortune, through your karma. Mm, awakening can happen <clears throat> in moments and in in big ways as well yeah so this is the inspiring story of walking through walls <clears throat> and uh, I encourage you to um, see if you can get a hold of uh, both of these books are wonderful. This is a really um, quick, simple read. Um, but amazing to hear about like an average person. <laughs> you know, she's just like a woman living in Calcutta. She's she's tiny too. She's like four foot something. How, old, how tall is she? She's super tiny. Um, and her determination, her deep calling to practice. I just saw a glimpse of it. I'm just seeing if I can find it again. Um, no, I'm going to let it go. Um, 
Yeah, it's an inspiring story. And it's easy for some minds to read it and just be dismissive of it, like the way we can be with things we haven't experienced. Um, and encouragement to give it another read. And um, that there may be things that we aren't aware of. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's practice, just like Deepama would be beckoning us to do practice, 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 diligently, ardently. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So posture is an important part of practice. And uh, I imagine Deepa Ma probably sat it in full lotus, but I know there was many times where she was bedridden and she would have been laying down. Uh, there were times that she crawled on hands and knees to get into the meditation hall and to be with her teacher, even though she couldn't understand his language. She didn't understand um, Burmese at that time that the teacher was teaching him, but she had this strong karma, this strong determination, insight, wisdom that she knew this is what she needed. So see what does your body need for a posture of awakening? And call in the energy of these wise teachers, Sylvia Borstein, these dear, curious, bright minds in this class of six year old, six grade six students. <laughs> Deepa Ma and her teachers. All of us have wise ancestors and kind ancestors somewhere back in our lineage. Feel their support. Feel how their striving and determination are part of the conditions of you being here now. the determination and courage and wisdom of the Buddha on the eve of his enlightenment when he sat down and said, I'm not getting up until I am enlightened. What do these Invocations feel like in your body? Do you feel some energy, some brightness, some strength? Where do you feel that in the body? What does it feel like? And then call into awareness, a recollection of a time where you hit a wall, where you were stuck in a wall, where you were busy reinforcing your wall of beliefs, of self, 
of protection, et cetera. Walls of aversion, of fear, of anger. And as you recall that, can you also remember or feel now how you reinforced that position? Telling over and over in the mind what someone did wrong, what you did right, how it should be, how you want it to be, et cetera, whatever the story was. And see that as reinforcing, cementing in. And recognize that that was a time of dukkha, a time of pain, of suffering. And then recognize that at some point it changed. You moved through the wall, either through wisdom, through skillful communication, wise action, compassion, the balm of time, we're simply stopping the reinforcing of the story. And if it's accessible to you, recall how that felt, that ending of suffering, that peace of heart and mind, how did that feel in the body? Recognize that this is your direct experience, that peace is possible right here in this very life, in this body, in these relationships, and in this very world as it is. And now bringing in this energy of our wise teachers, bringing in our 
to fuel the intention of recalling times of peace. And knowing that is possible for you. Now we will gently turn towards cultivating an anchor. Turning towards this one pointed cultivation stability of mind that Deepama mastered. So you might choose an anchor like the breath or the sensations in the hands. And just choose one. And we'll call up some determination like the question and the response of what happens if she gets distracted walking through the wall or moving through a wall? Does she get stuck? So let's see. What's possible for us to pay attention fully to each breath or each sensation in the hands? Let's check that out together in this next period of silence. Trying to sustain as much interest in the 20th breath as much as the first breath or the sensations now as much as when you began.
Practice is not about never getting trapped. It's about recognizing traps and choosing freedom.
cultivating a calm and stable mind that can pierce through anything with wisdom and compassion. May our practice and our lives become the conditions for awakening. May we know and remember this is possible and practice and strive skillfully. May I and all beings be free from suffering. Thank you for joining this practice and I hope there's inspiration there for you to continue to deepen your practice and check the links uh, below the recording for uh, these books. Thank you.